but you need to learn it. There, there are enough rules out there. There's privacy concerns. There's uh, Dodd Frank. If you've never heard of that, you can look that up. There are concerns with that. So things that you need to be aware of. Different states have different rules for licensing and things. So there's there's enough that you have to make sure that you learn the rules before you start to play the game. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Listen, if you're enjoying this show and getting some great value, tell us about it. Leave us a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you and get some honest feedback. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button so you don't miss an episode. We've got a great show today. We're going to be talking to Nathan Turner. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you want to grow as a multifamily investor, you have to spend more time with other multifamily investors. And an easy way to do that is to join our apartment investing mastermind group today. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the mastermind button. Now, as a part of this group, you'll get access to expert trainings, group coaching calls, industry news and updates, as well as all of our webinars and workshops, including our three-hour workshop on raising capital. Again, if you want to be around other multifamily investors that can help you scale your portfolio today and grow your network, make sure you're a part of the Apartment Investing Mastermind. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the Mastermind button today. Now, Nathan Turner is a residential mortgage note investor for over 15 years, and he's also the host of the Diversified Mortgage Expo, an annual conference touching all things note investing. Let's welcome to the show, Nathan Turner. Hey, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm feeling a little intimidated. You got the guy with the golden voice Gosh. and then you got me. So I'll give him my best shot. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. Listen, no, re no reason to be intimidated though. Hey, listen, I, I gave just a little bit of a brief uh, overview of who you are. Why don't you take two minutes and fill in some of those gaps for our audience? Sure. Yeah. So uh, probably the thing that people want to know most about is I'm from Canada. I live uh, just outside of Calgary, Alberta in Canada. And uh, that being said, everything I do is in the U.S. I haven't done any business in Canada for a long time. Everything uh, is just centered in the U.S. I buy residential mortgage notes, which may be new to some of the viewers, some of the listeners. But um, that means that instead of buying the property, that means that I buy the mortgage that's attached to the property. So I'm not necessarily in real estate, but it's real estate adjacent. My goal is to never actually own the house if I can help it. I would rather just collect the payments on that um, on that contract rather than owning the property and having to take care of it. So I get all the benefits of, of the cash flow and everything that comes with being a landlord, but I don't have any of those headaches. I don't have to take care of the property, no tenants, no toilets, termites, trash, even taxes. None of that's my issue. I love it, man. Listen, uh, you know, as a Canadian investor in the U.S. and notes, I think there's definitely some great information we're going to jump into here. Uh, you said your goal is not to actually own the real estate. So I think that's yeah. really cool and a great way for us to to wrap your head around this concept. Right. So you're yeah. investing in the note, not the real estate. You're not the borrower. You're not responsible for, you know, making any upgrades or fixing it or handling any tenants. You right. own the note. You're the bank, essentially. So that's the role you're playing. And that's you can invest it. in real estate by owning the note as opposed to actually owning the actual real estate. So really great insight. First of all, the obvious question or first question, I guess, that comes to my mind is as a Canadian investing in yeah. U.S. notes, what challenges are, are there? And, you know, from and I guess we should start by understanding note investing. But I, I think the, the question I want to get to is what are what additional barriers are there as a Canadian note investor as opposed to being US based? So let me ask my question a little bit of a different way to make it clean. Uh sure. you know, I'm an editor clean this up here, right? So pay attention yeah. to that. <laughs> so you are in Canada, you're investing in US notes. There's two different yeah. levels to this, right? There's just note investing in general. And then there's whatever bureaucracy there is from not being a US citizen. Let's start with right. the bureaucracy part of it. What additional hurdles do you have to overcome to invest in notes being a Canadian? You know, interestingly enough, very few. Uh, that was something that obviously I was concerned about getting started. Um, one of the biggest challenges I had for a few years was <clears throat> everything that I was doing, my bank account was uh, a, a Canadian bank with a US dollar bank account. So I operated like that for a number of years and it's mostly worked. It was a little bit awkward sometimes. I can't do an ACH payment, for example. So if somebody goes over and cleans up the lawn on a non-performing vacant property, 
you know, it was hard for me to get that guy paid. Uh, I can't just send a, a, a Zelle or something like that. And it was, so that's sometimes a challenge. Uh, but even that we overcame that just last year. In fact, we met a bank where they'll open uh, a U.S. based bank bank account uh, for Canadians with a, a Canadian business number. So it, that, I feel like that was kind of the last hurdle that we're <laughs> overcoming, but very few, you know, like I say, I'm not actually owning the real estate. Um, so that, that eliminates a whole bunch of liability, a whole bunch of headaches that come along with that. Can you elaborate on that side then? So to your point, if you were investing in the real estate directly, what yeah. additional hurdles would you have faced? Oh, things like uh, renovations. If I ever time, and I've done that before and kind of overcame that, this was a bit of a progression. I, I came from a real estate background, like a lot of people that do that come into notes. And so I, I it kind of took me a little bit to get my head around that. I, I don't actually want the real estate. And that, that was a realization that took well, some time, but a uh, thing like a, a renovation, um, any renovation from a distance is difficult across the border. It's just that much more challenging. Uh, just trying to keep track of everything and, you know, making sure you've got a contractor that you can trust and believe in, and they're going to do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. <clears throat> That's uh, that seems to be extra compounded. Um, that that was a major one that kind of took a little bit and then that's part of the decision of not wanting to own the real estate uh if ever i do i don't do any major rehabs you know we might do some minor cleanup of the property but that's about it so nothing that's going to take you know weeks or months to complete we're talking you know a few days kind of thing yeah and, and lending i know is always a bit of a kind of challenge for for folks who are not in this country right working with the banks to get approved for loans so lending can be a bit of a challenge uh but you're on the other yeah. side of that you know you are the bank in this case so help us understand yeah. a little bit more for those folks who are maybe listening or, and hearing about note investing for the first time explain exactly what note investing is and your particular strategy so note investing is where i go and buy the mortgage attached to the property now this can be depending on the state so ohio you guys are a mortgage state so in that case, I would buy the mortgage. Now, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, those three states in particular, lots of other states too, but I've, I've done a lot in those three states. Uh, those three states call them land contracts. Other states call it a contract for deed. Other states call it an agreement for deed, bond for deed, kind of goes on and on. But in our industry, we've kind of lumped those together to call them contract for deed. And that's where you you I would own the property and then I'm collecting a principal and a principal and interest payment every month where the borrower is the one that's still living in the house, taking care of it. I just happen to be the one on title. So that's a different kind of, of uh, security instrument that I can buy. Uh, I've even bought lease option contracts where it's, it's very similar to that land contract idea, that contract for deed where the person living in the house is the one taking care of it. The difference in that one is the person staying there is not making a principal and interest, they're just making a payment with uh, a flat fee going towards the principal. So it's a little bit different, but for me, the most important thing is I want it to be a uh, first lien against the property. So anything that's a first lien against the property. And like I say, whether that's a, a mortgage, a deed of trust contract for deed, uh, that's something that I would be purchasing. So, and Sorry. then again, just kind of get your head around that. I don't own the property in most cases. Uh, and that's to me, that's ideal. I don't want to own the property. I just want to collect on the monthly payments. That's it. Yeah. And I think that can be uh, somewhat confusing or it sounds like maybe yeah. we're, we're doing double talk here. So I want to play yeah. that back. Right. So yeah. you're coming in, you're buying the first lien on the loan, right? So there's a loan on, in place. You're going in, you're buying that. So the, the borrower is paying you that principal and interest. They're paying right. you. Uh, as essentially the the banker at this point, right? They're right. still living in the property. They're taking care of it. They're making, you know, any adjustments, any fix, you know, anything that needs to be fixed, anything like yeah. that, they're handling that. They're just paying you monthly, just like you would pay Chase Bank or any other bank, right? So that's how you're coming that's in it. as the investor. When we talk about ownership, right? When we talk about the deed and who actually owns it and, you know, that, that starts to get a little tricky. Like, well, what does ownership actually mean, right? Like it's my like it's house, the, so it's bank, the bank's yeah. house, right? So right. I think it comes down to it. What you're getting at is you're not responsible for the upkeep of the property. You have Bottom the line. deed. 
So you have the, you know, the ownership of the the property from a uh, from that from a legality standpoint, but you don't have the responsibility of taking care of this property and doing all that work. Yeah. Did I capture that the right way for everybody? Yeah, and and that's where it can get into the weeds a little bit, but but essentially that's it. So instead of me taking care of the house, I'm not the landlord, I'm the bank. So if you can kind of separate it that way and and think of what do banks do? What do they not do? Banks don't fix roofs. Banks don't fix toilets. You don't call your bank and say, Hey, you know, I've got this problem with the house. The bank would say, Hey, cool. Great. Good luck. You know what I mean? And that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, that's great to hear. And as investors, we can do that, right? And that's something that people may not be that uh, experienced with, but you can invest in real estate the same way Nathan is, right? Where you're not really being a landlord, you're right. buying the notes and you are essentially becoming the bank. How did you get into this, right? How did you learn and decide that this was the strategy that you wanted to implore to invest in real estate? Man, you know, it's so much in life is just right place, right time, talking to the right people. Networking is such a big deal. Uh, and yeah, I'm a huge believer in that. So it, it was kind of by accident, you know, I, it was a colleague of mine. He had moved down. He's also from Canada. He'd moved down to California. He had networked into a group of investors. And if you think back, they had bought this pro this portfolio of properties, mostly centered in the Midwest um, in April of 2007. So like right at the like peak of the market at that time, the, they were supposed to just flip that whole portfolio out to another group. And then that deal fell through. So by the fall of 2008, now they're stuck with 60 properties. They don't know anything about these properties. They don't know anything about real estate. They were just in for a, a quick deal. And now all of a sudden they own these properties and the, how, the whole world is just falling apart. So they gave us charge and said, okay, do whatever you can you know, try to make some lemonade out of these lemons, whatever you can do. So a couple of Canadian boys, we thought we'd invented seller financing where we thought it's just not really done in Canada. So we didn't know anything about it previously, but our idea was just to sell the houses on terms. So rather than try to rent them out, cause we didn't have an operating budget, nothing. We just had these properties K go. So that was what we had to work with. So let's sell these houses so that they're taking care of them and we just get to collect the payments. Great idea. And, and of course, that's not novel idea, but it was novel to us. So it was, it, Cincinnati was a, a place we were at, you know, all over, all over in that Midwest area. We had a bunch of properties. Um, and that was kind of the introduction. And then I was looking at some ways of, okay, now how do we dispose of these to get cashed out? Internet research stumbled into a guy that was teaching something that sounded very similar to what we were doing. So I went down to Texas, took his class, and sure enough, he was talking about people like me that were creating these contracts, these notes, and then selling them to him. And I'm like, oh, that's a cool idea. And, and so that was kind of where that came from. I went to my first note conference in 2009 down in New Orleans, and I just blew my mind, all these people that were talking about this thing that I had just barely been introduced into. And I just, I, it was, to me, just so exciting and just really fun. And it just has kind of gone from there. And here we are this many years later. I love it, man. Well, listen, I know when it comes to note investing, there's two ways to get into it, right? You can be active and do exactly what you do, uh, or you can decide you want to be truly passive and yeah. partner and invest passively with a group like yours. Let's yeah. start with the passive angle, right? What would it look like if someone wanted to invest passively? What is that process like? Yeah. So I put together just last year, I put together a 506C fund uh, reg d 506 c where we're taking on accredited investors and literally you, you put the money into the pot i go out and i buy i'm buying specifically performing notes so that means notes where people are making regular on-time payments uh and so far safer in that way far more predictable um Anytime I'm buying anything, I'm, I'm working in an equity spread in there in case of whatever, some kind of downturn in the market, somebody stops paying anything like that. But we work in whatever we can uh, so that our investors don't have to think about anything. All they know is they're getting paid uh, on a quarterly basis. We do quarterly payouts and they just get to sit and collect knowing that I'm out there doing what I love to do. Uh, and then they just get to benefit from that. 
Well, that's easy enough, right? Investors can can partner with a group like yours, and if they yeah. want to be truly passive, for that yeah. person who says, "Hey, this is interesting," but you know, I want to I want to dig in, right? I want to learn a little bit more about this. Uh, what are some things they need to know about you know investing in notes? First and foremost, it's not real estate. We're, and like I say, I came from real estate too. Uh, that's something that took me a little time to get my head around. This is the finance game. So we're buying the financing, not the property. The property is the collateral. So yes, we're doing some homework on that in case of, but, uh, but our main concern is the note itself. So there's note numbers. What's the monthly payment? What's the interest rate? What's the term? What's the first date paid? What's the last date paid? When is the term up? Uh, how many years was it amortized? Things like that all matter. And then you get into location, um, a place like New York. Uh, you cannot do a contract for doing New York. There's no advantage to it, at least. A place like Ohio, there are extra rules surrounding those land contracts that are not present in maybe other states. And so there's there's just a lot more stuff they need to learn. And like I say, I'm not, I'm not actually a teacher of this stuff, but... I can hook you up with people that will be willing to teach you, uh, but you need to learn it. There, there are enough rules out there. There's privacy concerns. There's uh, Dodd-Frank. If you've never heard of that, you can look that up. There are concerns with that. So things that you need to be aware of, different states have different rules for licensing and things. So there's, there's enough that you have to make sure that you learn the rules before you start to play the game. I love it. You talked about uh, one understanding the the note numbers, right? So understanding how this operates. This is finance, not real estate. So you really have to understand right. the terms of that note and recognize, you know, whether or not this is going to be a good investment. You talk about the terms, the length of it. You know, the amortization schedule, uh, the first day of payments, the last day of payments. You want to understand all these different things, and then also the rules. You know, what state are you in? What's the jurisdiction? What's the process? So yeah. making sure that you understand these things certainly a lot to learn. But if you do that, there could be some opportunities. You said something earlier when we were talking about the the passive side that you know yeah. you want to build in the equity spread. You know. Yes. Or someone thinking about this is like, well, what do you mean? You're buying, you're buying an existing note. How do you create equity on the yeah. note? Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, for sure. So let's throw in some numbers. So let's say, uh, just for example's sake, um, let's say the house is worth one hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, the balance on the note, what we call the unpaid principal balance, is one hundred thousand uh, dollars. Interest rate is, let's call it, seven percent. Uh, and payment, whatever that is, you know, $700 a month. I come in and I look at that and I go, okay, great. So automatically I already know that there's a $50,000 equity spread in there. So if it paid off today, I would get paid a hundred thousand dollars. So then I have to figure out a price that I'm willing to pay today. So that if I got paid off tomorrow, I know I would make some money automatically. Let's say they don't pay off tomorrow. Let's say that they go off you know, the next 25 years on that note. Again, I want to make sure that it's a, a number that makes sense for me to buy it today, knowing that I'm going to get paid out over time. So again, that's some of the math that you got to, you got to put into there. Um, when I buy anything, it's at a minimum. I want to make sure there's at least a 25% equity spread. So let's change those numbers a little bit. Let's say that the house is worth a hundred thousand. They sold it for a hundred thousand with a 10% down payment and the balance on the note is 90,000. So there's a 10% equity spread in there. That's great. I want at least 25. So the most I would be willing to pay for that note is 75,000. And again, that's also taken into consideration that that also means that there's a, a good uh, return on my return on my expense or my, you know, investment, um, according to what the interest rate is and how long that is. Like if it's a two year note versus a 30 year note, that that's a totally different calculation. Uh, so there's, there's a bunch of math that goes into that. And I, I don't mean to make it sound big and scary. It's totally doable. <laughs> uh, but considerations that maybe you didn't have to think about before when you're just talking about real estate. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, especially when you get a multifamily, but that's part finance, part real estate, part operations yeah. and construction, right? So you get, all those things that come together. And I think the thing that's intriguing about notes is, well, at least you don't have to worry about the, the tenant side of it, right? It's really just all yeah. owning the note and dealing with that. Um, you said that, hey, you, you typically look for a 25% equity spread or at least a 25% equity spread. Just to clarify, is that between 
what you pay for in the um the loan amount or the the value of the home or the yeah the value of the home and what you pay for it yeah so i call it investment to value so whatever i've invested versus the value of the property i want to make sure there's got it 25 percent in there if you think of the last downturn uh most places didn't see that much of a well depending on where you are but uh <laughs> just again to protect myself in there protect my investor make sure that it's not going to be all of a sudden worth less than what I paid for it. That makes sense. And then do you factor in how much equity the borrower has? So going back to that first equation you did where you said it, maybe the home was worth 150, the loan balance is 100K. In that environment, that borrower has essentially 50,000 worth of equity. Is that factor mm -hmm. into your model as well? Yeah, I want the borrower to have at least 10% equity. So it, it could be a brand new note um, where they just started making payments last month. That's great. I want to make sure that they put it at least a 10% down payment on that. I want to make sure they've got some skin in the game. You know, they feel invested into the property. They're not willing to walk away from that. Financially, they put some, some meat into that, into that whole deal. Yep. So that makes sense. Right. And, and your the bigger point of what you're saying is you want that borrower to have some equity and you don't want them mm -hmm. to have some skin in the game. And then you obviously want to mitigate your risk by making sure that you're buying at a low enough number where, you know, if something were to happen, you could still make a, make a profit. Right. Um, right. to your point, you know, I'm assuming most people don't tend to pay off their, their notes within uh, the first six months, the first year, or even a short time frame when they're borrowing from you, you know, yeah. so you're getting kind of the monthly payout from the mortgage and the principal and interest. Are there other ways to monetize this or other ways where you get, you know, do you get points or is there something else that you're doing to make this more valuable in the meantime? Kind of. <laughs> so when you're talking about what I'm buying is the mortgage note. So the, if you think about your own mortgage, you've agreed to pay the bank a certain amount with at a certain interest rate over a certain amount of time. Uh, the fact that the bank then sold that to me doesn't change those terms. So if there's going to be any changes made, if there's going to be anything that's going to be different, we, myself and the borrower have to agree on that. That being said, yes, I can go back to the borrower and we can offer things like, um, for example, uh, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but, but we can start negotiating and say, okay, if you paid an extra $100 a month, uh, then I would knock off $2,000 off the principal balance. Uh, and you do the math on that. And, and over time that actually works out m way in my favor at that same time, though, it actually does give the borrower a break because they're able to pay the house off that much quicker. Uh, in the note world, the faster, the better, the more, the better. So well, I'm looking for a higher payment or a higher interest rate or uh, a faster, like a shorter time, the faster I can get that, the better that's going to boost my, my returns. So that's, makes, yeah. we'll say it that way. <laughs> that makes, makes sense there. And then why, you know, I guess for folks who don't know this space, why would a bank or a, you know, a lender sell the note, right? I mean, it, you, yeah. we see it all the time, but uh, we don't really understand the why behind it, right? Whether it's Chase or whoever it is, you go out, you take out this loan for this property and then, you know, you know, within months, typically you get a letter saying that that note's been sold to, to someone else. Why does that happen? Liquidity. It's all about liquidity. If they can get a chunk of cash today versus little bits of chunk of little bits of money over time, over the next 30 years. Uh, and if it makes sense for them to do that, if they want to just get that chunk today, uh, that's really what it comes down to. And whether that's a bank or whether that's an individual who has a second home, they've sold it on terms, they've created a note uh, and they look at it and they go, okay, so for the next 25 years, I could be getting 500 bucks a month. Or this guy over here says he'll give me whatever, $75,000 today for it. Um, you know, and you start weighing the options and going, well, that with that 75, I could go take that vacation. I could remodel the kitchen. I could whatever, yeah. uh, do all kinds of different things with it. And have you, do you sell notes as well, or are you only in acquisition and buying mode? Occasionally I'll sell. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of depends. Um, just depends on what we're looking at. Uh, yeah. all kinds of different reasons why I, why I would sell. So for example, I've got one right now where, uh, my fund is a five-year term. 
So I'm actually looking to sell this one before the end of the five years, not right now, but before the end of the five years, because it's a shorter term. Uh, and so I can actually sell it for more a year in versus five years in, just because that's wherever the, uh, the principal balance is at that time. So that's, that's one example. That's another reason why I would sell that earlier rather than later. Obviously, a lot, lots of information here and, and moving pieces, but uh, great information. You know, if anyone is interested in learning more, uh, you've got your event coming up, so they should definitely check that out. The D Diversified Mortgage Expo. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do you do you change the location for that each year, or where? How do you handle that? So I actually took it over just last year. This was last year was the eighth annual today, or this year is the ninth annual. Um, we've changed the location to Nashville. Before that, it had kind of jumped around a little bit. Now that my wife and her are in charge, we're, we like Nashville. It's a ton of fun. It's pretty central, easy to get to. Uh, so Nashville, Tennessee is where it's at, May 31st, June 1st. And so looking forward to seeing everybody there. And <laughs> I hope, you know, people don't feel like this is too over their heads. This is for everybody, right from the very beginners to the guys with multi-million dollar portfolios. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised to see all those levels there last year. So we're excited to see that again. I love that. And Nathan, they can reach out to you if they have more questions. Nathan at earnestinvesting.com, Ernest, E-A-R-N-E-S-T-I-N-V-E-S-T-I-N-G.com, earnestinvesting.com. Right. Hey, uh, you know, you mentioned just kind of the price points or, or just kind of the portfolio, you know, for someone who doesn't have a lot of capital right now, like what's, what's the lowest amount someone can use to kind of get started? Uh, if they're actively investing themselves? Yes. Yeah. It varies wildly. The most, hmm, the least I've ever paid for a note was $500. And that was for a $2,500 balance over two years. Uh, and sure enough, they paid off early. So I actually, my return went even higher. So I, I, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about returns, that was a ridiculous return. Um, those exist. I would recommend if somebody's getting started, plan on about 50,000, uh, just That'll give you a good note on a decent property that is not going to be in any kind of, you know, major disrepair or that kind of thing. But like I say, first and foremost, make sure you get some training, make sure you get some education on how this all works. No, I love that. Love that. And I think that's really great too, because you certainly want to make sure the knowledge and the education is there first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're making the right investment. Uh, you talked about the markets just a little bit there. When you look kind of your portfolio what are markets you avoid i know you mentioned new york earlier but are there markets you avoid or markets that you really love uh yes and yes so tough markets northeast united states kind of the new england area so in new york new jersey maine uh connecticut all those eastern states northeastern states they're tough because um foreclosure laws in those states are really tough and so it's it's difficult in the case of default, if I do need to do a foreclosure, it's very difficult to get one done there, uh, more time consuming than anything else. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Texas is, you know, in theory, you can get a, a foreclosure done in two months. The fastest I've ever done is four, just so you have to hit the dates exactly right. So in that case, like I say, in the case of default, if you absolutely have to take the property back, you're not able to work something out, then that option's available to you. So I'm a big fan of Texas. Um, for me, it's kind of the eastern half of the country it tends to be. I like property values under 200000 so that tends to land me on that half of the country. Makes a lot of sense there. And the last question for you before we move to our round of insights. Uh, for that person who's looking to get started, where do you find these notes? How, how do you get started looking for them? <laughs> so that's the big trick is uh, this: you're not going to find them on MLS. You're not going to find them readily available. Um, I know it sounds like a pitch <laughs> conferences, honestly, and truly that is where I've found all my contacts networking like crazy. You talk to anybody in the business, they'll tell you that relationships are just that much more important in this world, uh, because it's such a small group of people. We tend to pretty much know each other, everybody. Uh, and so getting those relationships and then talking to people and say, say, you know, what are you selling? What are you buying and start matching up and pairing up with people? So that, that's, that's really the key. I would mention one website. Uh, you can go and look. It, it probably won't make a ton of sense to you just yet, but uh, Paperstack. Uh, so that's P-A-P-E-R-S-T-A-C. 
So just leave off the K on the end there. Paperstack.com, great guys over there. They've got a like an online platform where people can list their notes for sale and you can go and start looking at them just to get a sense of what's out there. Um, and then come and ask me some questions and we'll look at it together and we'll all tell <laughs> you if it's a good deal or not. I love it. Well, listen, definitely make sure we check that out. We'll make sure we link to your your email in the show notes there. Again, it's Nathan at earnestinvesting.com. Right now, we're going to go to our round of insights. Nathan, give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Oh, boy. Um, a failure that set me up for future success. I would have to say... Um, what I considered a failure at the time was uh, I came from real estate. I was flipping houses back 05, 06, like everybody else was. And then I got caught with one property and then ended up being a landlord. And for the life of me, I could not figure out why people were landlords. <laughs> I just thought this is an awful lot of work for not a whole lot of money. Uh, every time somebody moved out and, you know, given I, I'm sure I did a whole bunch of things wrong, but, uh, but, you know, for whatever it was, $400 a month, uh, I felt like there were much better ways to spend my time uh, to get that. And then I would have to go out and fix up the property when somebody moved out. And it was just a lot of work. So at the time that it felt like kind of a failure um, and I can see how that mindset where I'm like, well, I really like the cash flow, but I sure don't like anything else about landlording. <laughs> and that's kind of when introduced in this new world I'm, I've, we're looking at this and going okay well I don't want to be a landlord certainly not on these properties that we've got here if we can somehow figure it out where they're taking care of the property but we're collecting payments that makes sense and that's kind of where that idea spawned from give me the digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business I recommend if if you have not ever been introduced to this before, a financial calculator. I, it is indispensable, especially in the note game. I didn't know there was such a thing until I started working in notes. I was introduced to it in about 2010 and uh, I'd never heard of a financial calculator before, but I've got one on my phone. I've got one on my laptop, just an app on my phone, laptop, desktop, and I use it constantly every day uh, just to figure out those note numbers and figure out what's a good deal, what's not a good deal. How can we tweak this loan just a little bit? You know, if I go back and approach the borrower and say, how about we just change this a little bit and just see what the outcome might be? Huge, huge, huge. That's a big, big part of it. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. <laughs> uh, it's not a business book, but uh, my wife and I, we've got three kids. Our oldest is 18, youngest 14. So there's an author by the name of Leonard Sachs, and he writes all about, um, I guess, parenting and just children in general. Uh, he's got four books that I know of where it's why gender matters and the difference between boys and girls. And man, that's essential. Boys Adrift, why these, you know, young adult men are still hanging out in their parents' basement playing video games. Girls on the Edge. Uh, where girls and obsessions and things like that and things that are scary, <laughs> how to deal with that. And then the last one you just wrote is called uh, The Collapse of Parenting. Uh, and in fact, my wife and I were just looking at this last night. We lent it out to somebody and we can't figure out who. And so we we're actually going to reorder it just because it's such a good book. So uh, that whole series, I would recommend that to anybody. Awesome. Appreciate that. All right. Give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Uh, every morning, my wife and I, so she's my business partner. We do everything together. And every morning we bring out our plan uh, for over for the next five years. And we look at the different aspects of our business and where we want to be in and kind of envision that and see where we're going and how we're going to get there. And so we'll spend five minutes on that, just uh, kind of discussing that. And I think that makes a difference. That's been really good. Give me your number one insight to be a successful note investor. Uh, be willing to think outside the box. There, that's one of the things I love about notes is how many different directions you can go with notes is, and even getting into it, we didn't even get into it, but I like first lien mortgages on residential properties under $200,000. 
that's fairly specific. You could look at second lien mortgages. I've got a friend that does second and third lien mortgages out in California only. Uh, or you can look at performing or non-performing. You can look at, you know, deed of trust states only or mortgage states only or contracts for deed. There's just, there's so many different options. And so be willing to think outside the box, but at the same time, focus on what you're trying to do. I love it. Really good insight right there. Let's lighten it up. All right. So you are in Calgary out there in Canada. Give me your yeah. favorite place to grab a bite to eat. Oh boy. Um, right now there's uh in our town so we're just about thirty-five thousand people uh 20 minutes outside of calgary uh the place i've been to most often recently in the last few months is called matab indian restaurant and it's just fantastic indian food it's so good if i was right. let me let me give a, a cincinnati shout out uh skyline chili i love skyline chili and it's so hard to find anywhere else it's definitely a local uh, delicacy here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff, man. Well, listen, you, you have some great insights. I loved hearing your your take on note investing, how you got into it, why you got into it. And a couple of takeaways for me. One is just make sure you have a clear strategy. Make sure that you are educating yourself on the approach so that you have the knowledge that will help you guide you through that process. But then also making sure that we understand that this is a finance investment, not necessarily a real estate investment. So understanding mm -hmm. those numbers the terms, understanding your note numbers, that's going to be really critical. And then working with that borrower if you need to, right? Understanding what your strategy, your philosophy is, that's going to be the difference between success and failure. I appreciate your, your explanation on your equity spread and the way you approach that because that gives us a framework of how to structure this. Also, you talked about, you know, you find deals by networking and I think that's really key. And it's a big difference between what you do in the note investing space and maybe what most of our real estate investors are used to. Because you're investing in notes, you don't have like an emotional tie to this property. You don't have like a five-year deadline or seven-year horizon that you're working on. And it makes it a little bit easier for you to go out there and decide, you know what? Hey, uh, if someone makes me a good offer, I'm willing to sell. And, and I think that's helpful because there there it sounds like there's a lot more trading that takes place because they're just notes to you guys or numbers on a piece of paper right as right. opposed to a property you've put hundreds of thousands of dollars into and you're supposed to get a 15 yeah. percent irr after five years and right. you're only in your two of your business plan right so uh, yeah. i think the networking makes sense of why that's where those deals happen because you're talking to other folks who have these notes and they're willing to trade in that that space there uh, so that's really great i appreciate you sharing that as i was thinking about it more i'm like okay that does make a lot of sense so again yeah. if you are interested in learning more you've got your event coming up here in may uh, they can also email you nathan at earnestinvesting.com nathan thanks again for being a great guest and coming on multifamily insights we look forward to staying in touch with you and i hope you have a great day thank you so much so nathan i froze up on my side which is weird yeah. i can see you fine but somehow okay. i'm frozen on my own screen am i frozen on your screen too yeah you are so that's All right, well, that's, that's weird okay. i don't i don't know what this is going to look like in the, the video <laughs> edit I don't know what, I mean, you're fine, but I'm, I completely stopped. So, um, hopefully, I don't know, hopefully the editors are able to work through this. This might have to, I don't know, they have to work through this somehow, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Thanks Hey, let me, let me, let me, let me stop recording. Let's see if that.